Wall Street destroy everyone. You know, the hand five five Wall Street firms, you know, basically, you know, ki kill every trader and every investor out there. That's not fun. So, you know, how do we uh, fight back? And I'm on the side, I'm on the fundamental side. I worked for a tiger cub. I didn't, you know, ever want to do machine learning. I never wanted to do market making. But, you know, I followed quant since I was a kid as well. And I was always mystified by how these guys could beat, beat, beat our pants off every year. We worked so hard looking at stocks and they would just trounce us. And, you know, uh, I think it's, if you can't beat them, join them. But also, you know, uh, I wouldn't mind, you know, helping everyone learn how to do it. And then the playing field will be even again. And if the playing field's even, you know, that, that, that helps everyone. So you have an armamentarium of tools to, to potentially um, go after uh, folks. Quants aren't ripping people off. No, I think quants are making trade-offs. So they're making smart trade-offs, probabilistic trade-offs. You know, um, and I'm going to show you exactly how this works, and I'm going to even make you t tools that you can link with with brokerage APIs to do it yourself. The biggest thing that you have to understand about this is that the fundamentally, quants really do well. Here's an intraday chart of Pfizer. This is a really good chart for Pfizer for a quant. Um, you know, basically they're they're a market maker, so so they're sitting on the bid and the ask, and they're willing to offer you merchandise. It's kind of one way to think about it is inventory and merchandise. You know, imagine you're um, a retailer and you're stocking toothpaste. I don't have a toothpaste out here, but let's see, I have this Afrin. And you got a thousand of these Afrins, right? Now, a retailer only sells, but they do have to buy from their supplier. And they have a fixed bid ask, right? They're buying this thing for $2 and selling to you for 3 Well, the market's sort of like that. Um, you know, and, and to be a market maker, you have to say, I'm willing to buy at, say, $26.40. Um, and I'm willing to sell at 2642. Now, what, what's the problem? Well, if you get hit on both sides at once, I think I went through this the other day. Um, if you get hit on both sides at once, 2640 times 2641, you make a cent. You're, it's wonderful. Now, this is a spread that's very tight. You might instead want to do, say, 2635, and 2645. Now the odds are you're going to get hit at the same time on this are pretty low, but let's say you don't need to get hit at it within one second. Probability that you both of these trades go off in one second is not bad. And on a hundred shares, you make one single whole dollar, but you know on this one you make ten dollars. Now ten dollars doesn't sound too exciting, but it doesn't have to be a hundred shares. It could be more, and it could be every stock in the stock market. So if it's an extra. Uh, let's make it a thousand shares. That's a hundred dollars, and let's say you're doing this on a thousand stocks, and there's that you're doing that in five minutes, and you have enough money for this right now. I mean, that's a uh, thousand shares is only twenty six thousand dollars. Now you may not have enough money to do it in a thousand stocks, but if you do it in a thousand stocks, that's a hundred thousand dollars in five minutes, and you can you could you know linearize that, and you can see just you know let's see in an hour it's you know uh, twelve times that, so it's one point two million in an hour, and you know, it's about $10 million in a day if you if you successfully pull this off. Now, I, I'm not going to give you any illusion that that's necessarily possible, um, you know, with this amount of capital, but it is possible. It's just a question of how much capital you need. Um, and you will have losses and things like that. So I did talk about this last week. So in essence, as you sell here in this situation where the stock's rising, you know, you, you are accumulating a short inventory. You might be short $5,000 by the end of this. Now, you might also hedge. You might say, I'll buy spy to offset this or something. And as it goes up, you might say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to lighten my load on how much I'm willing to sell. Instead of 100 by 100, I might say, I'll buy I'll buy 1,000, but I'm only willing to sell 100 at this point because I'm so loaded up on short merchandise, short inventory. But look, obviously, if the market comes down, you, you really kill it because now you cover your short. What, what quants don't want is charts that sort of look like like this, you know, and there's plenty of growth stocks like that, and they're really hard to trade. There's other ways to make money in quants that will offset your losses, but making a market in something that's a straight line up is very tough. <laughs> you know, you basically will, will, will be rolled over and lose money. So if you have more of a chart that's like this, this is your, 
just money printer. And so you can kind of leverage off of the options market and say, well, what's the implied volatility? The options guys are smart. If there's a lot of vol, maybe it'll be the case where uh, it will be a market like this or somewhat like that. If it's not a lot of vol, maybe it'll look like this. So that's just sort of one clue. And, and again, we'll, we'll talk about doing this with multiple securities at once and what kind of things that brings. But I really don't think it's as hard as people make it out to be. Um, no, I mean, I, I don't look at charts the way you know, a lot of traders do, which is they try to divine what's going to happen. And, I, you know, look, Paul Tudor Jones does that. You know, he's one of the best traders of all time. Steve Cohen does that. So it's not like uh, you shouldn't do it or you can't do it. It's not my style. But the quantitative style, I think, is going to make a lot of people a lot of money. It already has made everyone else a lot of money. But I want it to make money for you and me and for smaller hedge funds that don't necessarily, you know, think they can do it. But, but I think that they're a lot smarter than they think in that, they could actually run quant books without too much trouble. I think there's this opinion. I was talking to one guy who, who actually was Citadel's first investor, so reveals who it is, but uh, some Chicago guys. And I said, do you, you invest in uh, quant? This is 20 years ago. I said, are you in D. Shaw? Are you in uh, this and that? And he said, no. He said, I think that space is an oligopoly. It's not understandable to me. The guys that do it well seem to do it well, and they don't tell us how, and that's it. And, and I think he was wrong and he missed, you know, if he kept that opinion, I don't know if he did or didn't, but if he kept that opinion, that was the wrong opinion. That, that, that opinion became, um, you know, you know, there became a lot more firms that did that well. So it wasn't Frank. It wasn't Frank. Um, Frank was basically Ken's partner. I put Frank on the inside of Citadel. I'm talking about the first sort of outside investor. Again, you, you'll, you'll figure it out. But um, point being that, uh, I don't know how we got off to quant because I want to talk about return on assets, but I think that the general idea of some of these algorithms is simple to understand. Implementing them is not simple. Implementing them really, really well <laughs> is not simple either. But, you know, some of that should probably be best standards or like something you, you can rely on a third party to do. Um, cause ultimately it's plumbing. Um, now choosing which stocks you want to run, what algorithms on, that's also a decision you sort of have to make, but I do think you can compete with some of the other quants. A lot of these algorithms are fairly similar. So in any event, that's, that's kind of what I want to get at. Um, again, the story gets deeper and more, common. you know, I think the, the thing to know is that the days of the fundamental analyst are coming to an end. Um, and how do we prepare people for that sort of uh, shift? And I think that there's a lot of things we can do to help um, not sort of let um, 